Thank you. That was awfully nice. <laughs> I think you made up a bunch of that stuff, but... Um, I want to start out by saying today that I am honestly honored. I'm not... I haven't heard the explanation of how they came across uh, who was going to be speaking. Maybe I kept thinking maybe they just need a really good contrast, you know. So... Uh, you could leave on, this is how not to take it home. So, But uh, I do feel, really feel honored to have the privilege of coming and sharing. And I also want to share with you that today, I, I feel incredibly honored um, to just be here. Um, to be a pastor in the Northwest, to be a pastor in Discovery uh, Community Church. I recognize today um, that I don't stand here on my own two feet. I, I'm here on the shoulders of of men and women who have been so incredibly faithful throughout the years. Uh, This summer I went to my mother's uh, 65th birthday party in northwest Missouri and we were sitting in a fellowship hall in this church. And my mother comes from a fairly large family and uh, one of my great aunts that honestly I I, I don't think I ever remember ever having a conversation with. She was always, you know, there at family gatherings. But she said, John, I need to speak with you for just a couple of moments. Do you have a minute? I said, absolutely. And uh, I sat down with sort of my, uh, this surprise that she would want to talk with me. And she said, I have something that's just for you. Um, and I, I think that you would get a lot out of this probably more than anybody else in the family. And she, she pulls out this manila envelope. And she sticks her hand in the envelope. And she pulls out a, a small pile of pictures, maybe four or five photographs. Um, the very first one on top. It had to have been over 100 years old, probably somewhere around the turn of the 20th century. Somebody had thought it would be a fantastic idea to put a camera on the other side of a western Kansas pond in the middle of a west Kansas wheat field and take this picture of um, this little small group of people. There was a man in long white shirt, uh, black trousers, black suspenders, and he was baptizing another figure. And uh, my aunt said, do you know who this is? And I said, no, I have no idea. And I'm smiling. She said, well, this is your great-grandfather. And uh, she says, uh, and I never knew my great-grandfather. He passed away right about the time I, I was born. She said, he received a call to ministry when he was 16 years old. By the time he was 18, he became a circuit preacher, uh, riding a horse around all through western Kansas. Eventually, he'd move to southwest Missouri and do the same thing for the rest of his life. And there in western Kansas, when this picture is taken, he's baptizing a woman. Do you see who the woman is? And I said, no, I can't make the woman out. And he says, he didn't know it then, but in a couple of years, he would marry that woman. That would become your great-grandmother. And uh, and I thought, well, this is a neat story. And then she just looked at me and she said, "Um, this is your legacy. Now, I wouldn't be here today. The church I serve wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the incredible faithfulness of men and women who lived and served in much more difficult times than I. Who made such more incredible sacrifices as hard for me to even fully imagine. I'm here today, and a, a church in the middle of Tacoma is here today. Several hundred people have been baptized in the last ten years. Families have been put together. Lives have been mended because of faithful men and women, some whom I will never see, some who sit in this room. And I want you to know today I am incredibly honored. My first pastor in the Northwest, David Young, um, taught me the value of prayer uh, like I'd never seen before. Taught me the power of God's Word and my wife and, my, and myself are here today because of a really great conversation in his office one day. Um, I'm here today because someone like Gary Irby, who believed in something when oftentimes I didn't believe in it. Someone like Bevan McWhorter, who constantly worked behind the scenes all the time to make things happen when things shouldn't have happened. I am here today. A church is thriving today in the middle of Tacoma because men and women who have been faithful pastors who have constantly opened up their lives um, Scott Brewer, several times, has just I've called him up in a panic. What, do you, what would you do? I can just imagine now that he's probably laughing on the other side. Idiot. <laughs> Billy Arnold, who's been a good friend of mine, I have no idea why. He, every time I call him up and say, can I meet with you? He says, sure, and he makes time for me. He's a busy man with lots of important things. There's a church in the middle of Tacoma. 
people who are growing in Jesus Christ because of faithful men and women, I just want to share to you today that church planting matters. And the sacrifices that many of you in this room have made really matters. It's making a difference in the lives of many people. And I want to say thank you. I'm honored. I'm also humbled today. And uh, I don't know if you recognize this. If you've never been around a church planter, you should. There's an interesting thing that church planters have. Church planters call it different things. They call it drive, enthusiasm. Church planters call it, you know, entrepreneurship. Straight up, there's an old-fashioned word for it. It's called arrogance. Okay? Church planters are prideful. And I remember not so very long ago in those early stages of drawing out plans and putting up nice big post-its on the wall and imagining all the great things God was going to do once we just put this shingle out to say we're here, the entire city of Tacoma would just come flooding into wherever we were meeting and just great revival would be sweeping. And I thought and imagined in those days that there would be a day that I'd be standing before other pastors and perhaps peers and just sharing my incredible wisdom that I have. So 10 years down the road, this is what I discovered. I don't know Jack. If you're taking notes, it's Jack, J-A-C-K. So, Yeah, I, today I have uh, more questions than I have answers. I have more failures than I have successes. I know very, very little. But there are a few things that I think that I have learned Um, A couple of things that God just continues to drive down deep into my soul over and over again. And so since I've been given this this opportunity, I just want to share with you one of those things that God just keeps driving into my heart and soul. I think it's an essential thing. I think it'll make a difference in your life like it is in mine. I think it will help us leave a legacy. Uh, About six months ago, I was prepping for my 2012 teaching calendar, and I'm... I was determined to preach through um, Acts. And so about six months ago, I'm reading through the book of Acts, and I came across a story, a story that I've read lots of times. Honestly, I've never heard anybody teach on it or preach on it, and so I glossed over it the first time. As I'm going back to reread it, I glossed over it the second time. And the third time as I'm reading it, it's one of those moments that the Holy Spirit just grabs a hold of your neck and says, slow down. Look, you know, it grabs me in the back of the neck. Look, and it's been just chewing away at me ever since. It was in the early stages of the church. The church had just sort of exploded on the scene after the days of Pentecost. Great things were happening. Um, the church was growing. The Lord was adding to their number daily. It was an exciting time. You and I all would have loved to have been there. It was great. It was fantastic. The church had a little bump, if you remember. There's a little bump in the road where there's some conflict, there's some friction, some people weren't being taken care of. That's okay. Church handled it. They raised up new leaders. um, And just almost as quickly as the bump uh, looked like it was going to derail the entire thing, no, it's saw by new leadership, new things begin happening. Of those new leaders that are raised up is a guy named Stephen. You remember Stephen? Stephen was a fiery fellow. Gets himself in a bit of a, a bit of a pickle, and as you know, the story goes: Stephen is martyred. He's murdered. He's executed. Um, a lot of times, when the bad things happen in the church, things just you know just kind of gets more fuel to the fire. But honestly, at this particular moment, it doesn't. the The apostles kind of retreat. Uh, the head leaders just sort of gather. They kind of hole up for a little bit in Jerusalem, and it says the rest of the church is scattered. They're dispersed. It was a dark season. Interesting thing happens, though, as the church is dispersed, all of a sudden those new leaders begin going to new places, and they begin to communicate the gospel in fresh and new ways, and revival begins to break out in other places, like a place called Samaria. Philip, one of those new leaders, he finds himself in Samaria. And Philip is one of those guys that wherever he goes, it's like gold. You know, everything he touches turns to gold. He goes and he preaches, and people are saved. Hand over fist. Revival breaks out. God's doing miracles through the life of Philip. People's lives are being changed. Cool, fantastic things are happening in Samaria. Philip makes his way down into one particular village. In that village, revival breaks out again. It's a cool moment. It's exciting. There's momentum and movement going on with the gospel. There's a guy in the village named, anybody remember? Nobody. Simon. Okay. 
So now you're picking up. Okay, he's about in Acts chapter 8. Okay, so if you want to, to check on my story, flip to Acts chapter 8. So, so he's in this village. He encounters this guy named Simon. Simon is gifted. He's very talented. He's, he's probably eloquent, great speaker, a motivational guy. He's used all of his gifts and his talents, most likely to leverage them for his own good. In fact, the Acts chapter 8 says he's got a great power. When Philip comes in town, he's preaching this good news about Jesus Christ. Interesting thing is Simon doesn't fight against him. Acts chapter 8 says, no, Simon's caught up in the revival. The text itself says Simon becomes a believer. He invites Jesus Christ to come into his life. He leaves his old life behind. It goes on and says something else. He makes a public confession of faith. He's publicly baptized. Listen, Simon is fully in. Uh, Acts chapter 8, different versions will say things like he's the sorcerer, he's the magician, all these sort of things have colored it, but think about it for a moment. He's a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. If you keep reading the story, you discover something else about Simon. Simon gives up his entire old profession and he devotes himself to following Philip around. He now becomes a disciple of of Philip. He's probably in Philip's inner circle. Everywhere Philip goes, Simon's there. He's soaking it in. He's loving being a part of this new and fresh movement of God. It's an exciting thing for Simon. Word gets back to Jerusalem. Apostles are holed up there looking for some sort of good news. They hear that there's revival breaking out in Samaria. So they send Peter and John and they go to Samaria to check it out. And they're like, wow, this is good. But no one has received yet the gift of the Holy Spirit. So Peter and John begin working through Samaria, and they're praying for people, praying that they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The text goes on, it says, Peter and John begin to lay their hands on people to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Simon's watching every bit of it. Now, as a good Baptist, I'm not sure what that looked like. Anybody? I mean, but as a good Baptist, I know what it didn't look like, right? When, when, when Peter and John laid their hands on people to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, I'm pretty confident that they didn't begin rolling around and screaming. As a good Baptist, I believe this. As a good Baptist, I don't believe that they jumped up with shouts and began laughing hysterically. I don't believe that they were slain in the Spirit and John said to be healed and I don't believe any of that took place. I mean, maybe occasionally someone began to speak with gifts of the uh, spirit or gifts of tongues. I imagine that those sort of things probably began to happen in some way. But I believe, as a, as a good Baptist, that when someone receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, this is the number one evidence of the Holy Spirit. They proclaim the word of God boldly. So I believe when Simon was watching Peter and John lay their hands on people, What Simon saw was men and women stand up and go out and preach the gospel. Simon watched men and women go back into their communities and their communities be changed. I believe when Simon saw those things happen, he watched leaders be developed. And when Simon saw that, Simon said, I want to be a part of that. I believe Simon said, you know what, I want to be on the inside of this. I don't want to just read about it. I don't want to watch other people with that anointing and that power and that blessing. I want it too. And so Simon did what any person would do. He went to Peter and John. He said, I've got to have it. Let me have it. I'll give you anything. I'll give you my right arm. I'll give you all the money I have just so I can have this anointing. And when you think that this was some sort of back alley deal, it wasn't... uh, The same word, offered money, is the same word that's used when the wise men came and brought their gifts before Jesus and offered their gifts before the infant Jesus. Simon was offering everything. He says, I want to be on the inside of this. And when I think about that, I realize that Simon is me. That's what I want. I I don't want to be on the outside looking in. 
I want God's anointing on my life. I want God's anointing in my church. I want to watch leaders be developed. I want to see missionaries be sent out. I want to watch lives be transformed. I want you to know honestly, I want it. I would give my right arm for it. But I want you to hear today what Peter says to Simon. Peter says, may your money perish with you. Because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Peter says, I don't know, somehow things got so incredibly sideways in your life, Simon. He says, Simon, this isn't a little thing. You think that this is a little thing. This is no little thing, Simon. This is a big deal. Somewhere along the line, you thought that you could somehow earn, buy, obtain, read about, conference in, the anointing, the gifts, the Holy Spirit, the movement of God, you could somehow usher in by reading, buying, obtaining, what else is doing in some way, that the blessing of God would rest on your ministry. And it just doesn't happen that way. Simon, you cannot want it in. You have to wait it in. Boy, if you're taking notes, and I do encourage note taking, I'd write that down. You cannot want it in, you have to wait it in. We love Acts chapter 1 verse 8. Man, that's like a hallmark verse for us, Northwest Baptists, right? Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you shall receive, anybody? Power. Power. Boy, the guys are like, this is like 2 in the afternoon. Okay, you shall receive, there we go. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my... Yeah, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost ends of the earth, okay? The last words of Jesus. Check it out. It's not a command. It's a promise. You know where the command comes in? Four verses before this. You want to know the last command of Jesus? Let's read it. Acts chapter 1, verse 4. This is what Jesus said to the apostles. So on this occasion, he was eating with them, and he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but anybody want to take a guess? But wait. The secret to God's power, his anointing in my life, in my church, does not come through wanting it in. It comes from waiting it in. God tarries. Because he's waiting for his men to wait well. Why does God tarry? I, he's not willing for any to perish, but for all to come in repentance. But for some crazy reason, he waits for his men to wait well. And so we better learn how to wait well. If I learn how to do anything, it better be learning to wait well. What does waiting well look like? I only got a few minutes, I'm assuming. Fortunately, there is no clock in here, so we are good to go. Um, I'm going to share with you some things that I believe what waiting well looks like. Okay? Waiting well. What's that look like? God's men who wait and who wait well are men who wait close. Proverbs chapter 8 says, Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my doors and waiting at my doorway. I'll read it again. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my doors and waiting at my doorway. It's this great picture of God waking up in the morning, putting on the robe and going in the front door to get the paper. And he opens the door. And there they are. There's four or five of them just hanging out. What are you guys doing? We're waiting here. This is what we do. We wait. I love Exodus 33. Anybody dig Exodus 33? I love Exodus 33. If you know this, anybody remember the song, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me? Right? 
Exodus 33 is the text for that. Moses wants to see the face of God, and God says, Okay, Moses, cool. I mean, he's gonna hide, I'm going to hide you first in the cleft of the rock, and I'm going to pass by. Exodus 33 shows us what a great leader does. Exodus 33 tells us that Moses, um, he built a tent of meeting just outside the camp. And he'd go and he'd climb in that tent, and then Exodus 33 tells us that there Moses would meet with God face to face as a man meets with his friend. It's a fantastic moment in Scripture. It says that every time Moses would enter into this tent of meeting to hang out with God, clouds would come and settle over the tent, and there'd be peals of thunder and lightning that would flash, and up to, depending on your interpretation, up to about four million people, uh, the people of Israelites, all the Israelites would come and they'd stand at attention at the front of their tents. It was a fantastic thing as Moses would stand there, would be in that tent meeting with God. It was awesome. But the coolest picture in Exodus chapter 33 is what happens in verse 11. It says Moses would come out of the tent and then the clouds would leave and the lightning would stop flashing and the thunder would dissipate and all the people would go back to their daily lives and business. But there is one who would wait. It says in verse 11, a man named Joshua would go and he would just wait. And it says he would not leave. You know, when God wants to move in a generation, when God wants to move in a city or in a church or a neighborhood, he looks for men who wait close. If you had to grade yourself a day, if you put a little scale out from 1 to 10, 1 being, man, I am just completely asleep in my relationship with Jesus. I read the Bible, but I knock out. Or 10 being, man, it's just red hot. Where would you put yourself? As a man, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a man or woman who wants to be used by God, you ought to be red hot. Your relationship with God, that intimacy that you share with the Father, should be so rich in your life. Men who wait well are men who wait close. Secondly, men who wait well are men who wait with love. Hosea chapter 12, verse 6, But you must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and wait for your God always. I'll read it again because I think we kind of slip over this sometimes. You must return to your God, maintain love and justice, and wait. When God looks for a man that he's going to use to transform a city, a church, a neighborhood, even a family, God looks for men who wait with love. How are you in that department? Probably the greatest passage in the New Testament about the methodology of the church, how the church operates, what a healthy church looks like, is found in 1 Corinthians, right? Paul is moving along, talking about really cool gifts of the Spirit and powerful things. And then he just stops on a dime at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, doesn't he? He says, you know what you need? You really need a good wedding sermon. <laughs> right? That's what a pastor needs. I mean, if you really want to see God move, you need a wedding sermon. No, it says he's moving along through 1 Corinthians. He's like, you know, let's just stop for a moment. Let's not miss the biggest deal. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, and I can fathom all mysteries and knowledge and have a faith that can move mountains but have not. Watch this. I am nothing. Let's talk to guys for a minute again. Is If you did that same scale and then you took it and gave it to your wife, how would you grade me, honey, as a lover? What would she grade you? How about your kids? And he really likes the church. How about the deacons? And you, how about your friends? Do you have friends? And when God wants to move in a city, in a generation, in a time, in a season, he looks for men who wait with love. Number three, 
When God looks for men who wait well, um, He looks for men who wait hard. Okay? Wait hard. Luke chapter 12. Jesus says, Be dressed, ready for service. Keep your lamps burning. Like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. So that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. It will, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching when he comes. I tell you the truth, he will dress himself to serve. He will have them recline at the table and he will come and wait on them. It will be good for those whose servants, whose master finds them ready. And I really dig Peter. It's interesting, Jesus is just working it, right? He's, he's just talking about being ready, working hard. And then you know what Peter does? Um, who are you talking to? That's what Peter says. I'll read it uh, verbatim. Peter says, uh, Lord, are you telling this to us or to everyone? And Jesus says, well, to make this really crystal clear, I'll tell you who I'm telling this to. Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? Who do you think he's talking to? Anybody? Come on now. Talking to us. He said, this, what I just told you, this this parable is for people who've been given a stewardship. It's for shepherds who've been given a flock. You work hard. When you see me tarrying, you work hard. When it seems like a long way off, you work hard. When it seems like I'm not moving in the speed you'd like me to, you work hard. Because I promise you there will be a day that you you won't see it coming. I'll come like a thief in the night. And I hope that you're working hard. I think there's another interpretation of this, and that is, you know, there'll be a time when your neighbor will be soft to the Spirit. You guys know this. You've been in ministry. You know that there's just, oftentimes, just a window. There'll be a moment when your neighbor will soften to the Spirit and the move of God. The question will be, will you be there? Will you have clocked in the hours? Will you be in the right place at the right time when your city goes through some sort of tragedy And they start looking around for who can they trust? Who can they go to? And if you've been working it hard, if you're in the right place at the right time, you'll be there. Okay, people who wait, wait close, wait with love, wait hard. And let me give you the last one. Men who wait well, wait with hope. Proverbs chapter 13 Hope deferred makes the heart sick. But a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. If you are a leader and a pastor, if you're a shepherd, if you've been given a stewardship, and you have a dream, and it's not happening, It messes you up. When you set up the chairs on Sunday morning and half of them remain empty, you go home and you're messed up. When you think that there ought to be more leaders being raised up and they just aren't and you don't know why, you get messed up. When you think that you ought to be having many more baptisms than you're having, or it's been, it seems like an eternity since that tank has been filled with water at all, you get messed up. It's not only normal, it's right. It ought to tear you up if what's supposed to be is not. But listen very carefully. You have to be careful with that. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, it says... um, Be careful about that root of what? Anybody remember? That root of bitterness that springs up and causes dissension or some versions say trouble. A lot of times we interpret that like, that's the deacons. (laughs) That one was written. I don't think so. I don't think that was written for the deacons or that old Sunday school class has been driving you nuts. 
I think that was written for pastors. You have a dream, man. You see your city like nobody else sees it. You know what God wants to do in your church. And it's tearing you up. That's okay, but be so careful. Because if that bitterness, it turns into bitterness, and you start blaming everybody else and their brother, you start getting mad at everybody else, it will kill the dream. You and I, as pastors and leaders, we are, we are bearers of one of the rarest of commodities. It's called hope. And we have to hold on to hope like nothing else. When people walk into your small group, or people walk into your home, or they sit down in your office, or they show up to sweep the front steps, or they show up to set up chairs, or set up sound systems, you know what they're there for? They want hope, man. They want to look into your eyes and believe that there's a reason why they do this. Because the people we serve, they work hard jobs. They're going through difficult circumstances. Their kids talk back to them. They don't have enough money in the bank. Things are going wrong all the time. And they're looking for someone to give them hope. And when we're waiting for the movement of God, we must be the bearers of hope. We must wait with hope. Micah 7 says, But as for me, I watch in hope for the Lord. I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior, and my God will hear me. Psalm 130 says, I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I put my hope. Psalm 33 says, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Listen, I believe when God moves, he doesn't look for a plan, he looks for a man. When God wants to move, he doesn't look for a plan. He looks for a man, and he looks for a man who waits well. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the entire earth that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Ezekiel says, God says, I look for one who would stand in the gap. And so I ask you the question today, are you that man? Are you waiting well? Because boy, this generation and the one to come needs men who wait well. Would you pray with me? Jesus, I am am so incredibly honored Why on earth would you save someone like me? You know every corner and recess of my mind. You know where I've been, what I've said, where I've walked. Simply the fact that you've called me your child is amazing to me. And on top of that, you, you gave me a stewardship. And between you and me, I'll never understand that one. You've watched me do some stupid things. I've tried to emulate other people's plans. And I've ignored being the man. You know how I've anguished and and begged you and tried to convince you how deeply and desperately I want it as if wanting it was enough. But today I'm making a commitment to wait. To wait well. And I pray, I pray God, that somehow as we wait well, you will transform our generation our cities, our neighborhoods, our churches. And I pray that there will be a day that when we gather together as Northwest Baptist, that we gathered simply for celebration, that we come to celebrate the harvest, 
That is my prayer. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.